Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. In today's Kerbal Odyssey, I'll be attempting to construct a land train rover, the chassis of which I am currently constructing on screen, and then sending it to the Arctic tundras of Juna. I've built really large roving bases in the past, but one issue with rigid rovers is that they really struggle with changes in terrain. As you go over the edge of a ridge, the front wheels end up leaving the ground, and as the centre of mass of the rover passes the the ridge, the front then slams down and then the rear wheels fly up like a seesaw. This can often lead to damage to the wheels and poses significant concern now that wheel repair requires a finite resource. Plus, it just looks a bit dumb. So to address this, I'm constructing a long roving base that's segmented into three carriages. Each carriage is joined to the next with two hinges, one for vertical hinging and one for lateral hinging, meaning that when we encounter terrain level changes, the base won't seesaw over the edge quite so dramatically and remains far more controlled controllable during rough terrain since more of the wheels are in contact with the ground at any one time. The number of wheels here may seem excessive and that's because the motors in these particular wheels aren't very strong and given that this base is going to have quite a high dry mass, the extra wheels mean that it can continue to power forward during steep ascents in the terrain. As for the base modules themselves, which you can see I'm well underway with the construction of, I decided to have a front engine module that will serve as the main living and unsurprisingly, navigation quarters. Behind this, we have the main science unit, which will be where the bulk of the base's functionality is situated. And then bringing up the rear, we have the engineering quarters. We have two large ore tanks, drills, and a Convertitron 250 ISRU. This rear module is probably the most pointless one since we don't have any fuel tanks to refill, nor do we have any need to refill any tanks since we have no rocket engines on board. However, I wanted to include it for A, completeness sake, B, in case we later wanted to add a fourth carriage that contains the launch pad for a powered vehicle that requires refueling, and C, we can pretend that those ore tanks are actually water bowsers that are filled up through mining and filtering of water ice using the drills and convertitrons so that this craft has a continuous supply of water. And speaking of water, here is a nice place the Kerbals can drink it at this little, uh, I decided to add a little silly rooftop bar to that front module just because it looked kind of cute and I've been following a lot of the SpaceX Boca Chica developments as part of my Space This Week series which is uploaded every Monday, you should totally subscribe so you can watch that. And and they're adding a bar to the top of their rocket factory, which is kind of cute. And I thought, let's do something silly with this base as well. One other feature that might not be completely obvious at first is that small crane I added to the rear left side of the front module, which can grab objects and or kerbals from the surface and place them uh, wherever, I guess. <laughs> Just in case one of our kerbals gets a little worse for wear during a whiskey session in the rooftop bar, the crane can be safely used to move them to the ground without making them risk using a ladder. I'm sure it can be used for other practical things as well. <laughs> Anyway, as you can see, we're just dotting the I's and crossing the T's now. As for the next phase of construction, I'm going to anchor the whole structure in place using a scaffold made of fuel tanks, which will provide our landing engines with fuel, while also providing a good spine to anchor the rover to during flight. The remainder of the rocket is actually fairly generic, and without wanting to waste any more time, I'm not actually going to show you the construction of it, and instead fast forward to the actual launch of the vehicle. And here it is, on the launch pad. And yes, the eagle-eyed among you may notice there's no launch escape system, so hopefully nothing goes wrong during launch since the Kerbals don't really have any means of protection from explosion of the lower stage. Don't worry guys, they do, however, have protection of their privacy online. Thanks to this video's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN. CyberGhost VPN currently helps keep over 36 million customers all over the world stay safe and anonymous. Their extensive network includes over 6,100 VPN servers across 90 different countries, and they have dedicated apps for pretty much every platform, from Fire Stick to Windows, iOS to Android TV, every platform is covered. Which is great, because one CyberGhost VPN subscription can protect up to seven devices at once, allowing you to torrent safely, harness the full potential of your streaming services by unlocking geo-restricted content on sites such as Netflix. That's because a VPN hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection, making you anonymous and keeping you safe. The best part about CyberGhost VPN though, the price! By using my affiliate link on screen and in the video description, you'll get 82% off paying 
just £1.99 or $2.15 per month plus three extra months free. CyberGhost VPN are so confident that you'll like their service, they offer a 45 day money back guarantee as well. In a world of geo locked content, the ever present threat of cyber attack, and the lack of privacy over public Wi Fi, a VPN is becoming an ever more essential thing. So why not choose CyberGhost VPN? Go on, make the move. Click that link in the description. <clears throat> but uh, moving on, as you can see, our ascension is well underway. Now, as always, we are launching at an optimal Duna transfer window. You can precisely calculate this using the transfer window planner website. You can find it by googling that, or you can do what I do and just head on over to the tracking station and time warp to a point where, if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the Sun to Duna, the angle that line forms at the Sun should be around 45 degrees. It's important to note that Duna needs to be ahead of Kerbin in this scenario, not behind it. I know I say this same thing every single time I do a Duna mission, it's been memed enough on the KSP meme subreddit, but I feel like it's always worth saying because this might be your first Matlown Duna mission video ever. I haven't done a Duna mission in a while actually now I think about it. I did that Blunderbirds not too long ago, but I remembered I abandoned my Destination Duna series, didn't I? Like everyone keeps on talking about Bring Back Life on Lathan and all that, but you guys forgot about Destination Duna, at least I forgot about Destination Duna, but not today. We can forget about this though, the lower stage, which is about to run out of fuel, and yes, it's a horrendously ugly lower stage. Yes, those weren't side boosters that would detach all efficiently and then leave the central core fully filled with fuel. Did that make sense? Fully fueled with, no, it's fully filled with fuel. It's getting late, guys. Uh, it was just one big monolithic structure because just easier, in it, you know? And then we've got the upper stage, which is two Mastodon engines, which are quite powerful for an upper stage, but we have a colossal amount of weight to lug into orbit, so it's nice to have the extra thrust weight ratio provided by those Mastodon engines. You know, the F1 uh, analogs that came with the Making History DLC? That's what... Uh, I, I mean when I say masters and engines. And there go the payload fairings quite a while ago actually and we can see the land train being held nicely in place by that fuselage skeleton structure that I mentioned in the time lapse right before we skipped ahead to the launch of the rocket. But there's not really very much rocket left is there? We've only got a tiny amount of fuel left in that upper stage which I'm not going to burn to completion because I want to detach it just before we reach a stable circular orbit so that it doesn't get left floating in space and instead will decay and burn up in the atmosphere of Kerbin. Uh, and for our final stage which is going to get us all the way to Juna we've got two of the Wolfhound engines which while they're not as efficient as the nuclear engines have much better thrust to weight ratio than the nuclear engines which means we only have to do one escape burn to get us all the way to Juno's sphere of influence rather than having to do several burns at Kerbin periapsis. Sometimes nuclear engine burns are just so long it's really not feasible to do one giant burn to get to whatever destination you're planning to get to. Although now I think about it, Juno is actually not that far away, so maybe we could have gotten away with it uh, having uh, only nuclear engines power us. But one other benefit that the Wolfhound engines provide is that they have a gimbal in that those nozzles can uh, move to counteract any imbalance of center of mass and center of thrust, which as you can see, we kind of had that problem here, I guess because the payload is so imbalanced. So I kind of had to use uh, the WASD keys to keep the rocket pointing along the prograde vector as we did that burn, which meant it took a while to do that burn for me because I couldn't use physics time warp faster than times two, but luckily for you guys, doesn't really make that much of a difference since I can just uh, speed up the footage by 12 times in uh, my video editing software. As you can see right now I'm creating a mid-course maneuver node to kind of correct our inclination. We're going to be passing a little bit too far away from Juno to get the orbit I want so I'm just adjusting our encounter now to get us on a nice pathway that will allow us to circularize into a polar orbit so that we can easily decelerate and land at the poles of Juna. The reason I want to land at the poles of Juna, by the way, if anyone is wondering, is because land trains have been used for several applications, including long haul lorry driving in places such as Australia, but one of the more cool uses that uh, has been proposed of the old land train concept is uh, Arctic exploration, especially with Latorno Technologies Incorporated, which was an American manufacturer of heavy construction equipment and also the overland train which I think remains one of the coolest looking vehicles ever designed with massive 
massive ridiculous wheels and a colossal length which could tackle all manner of terrain. Sadly, they never really saw much use and the concept these days isn't really used beyond tourist novelty transport and, like I said earlier, long haul lorry driving. But I thought we could revive the spirit of this monster nonetheless in Kerbal Space Program today and hence why I'm sending it to the Arctic. I did consider just sending it to Kerbin's Arctic because I guess that's the closest thing to the Earth's Arctic, but I thought, you know, Juna's Arctic is a little bit more challenging to get to, a little bit more fun to get to as well, and it still looks pretty close to what, again, Earth's Arctic and indeed Kerbin's Arctic looks, so kind of a win-win-win-win really. Is that how many wins was that? Doesn't really matter. As you can see, our circularization around Duna is complete. We're using the final stage, which is designed to land this thing, but it does have a bit of extra delta V to do things like circularization and deorbit. You may have noticed I quickly lowered our periapsis to intersect Duna's surface before detaching the other stage that is obviously now gone uh, to make sure that crashed into the surface of the planet and wasn't left stuck in space. Cluttering up space, contributing to Kessler syndrome, we don't want that. So that's why I, I did that uh, weird manoeuvre where I lowered my periapsis into the planet just in case anyone was a bit uh, confused by that and wanted some clarification. Now as you can see we are cruising towards the surface of Duna but you may have noticed that once those parachutes deploy our vector engines are going to be pointing the wrong way. The train is going to be landing on its wheels so those vector engines are pointing completely the wrong direction. We need them pointing, you know, downward toward the wheels. Luckily, dear viewers, I did consider this and engineered a solution which you might have picked up on if you looked really, really hard at how those vector engines attach to their fuel tanks. Ready? -da 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 -da. That's right! They're attached to hinges which are in turn bound to action group number two, I think. So now they are pointing the right direction to enable a uh, controlled descent down to Duna's surface because the atmosphere is a bit too thin to rely on parachutes alone, especially for a craft with a mass as high as this one's. Now I'm using the vector engines because, you know, they might seem a bit overkill, but they have incredible gimbal range and this thing's center of mass is all over the place. It's not very well balanced. So having engines that are powerful and have very, very high gimbal limits makes the whole landing procedure a little bit more controllable and a little bit easier. Speaking of which, there it is. We have touched down safely so we can enable the brakes so we don't accidentally roll down this hill. And now comes the uh, unnecessarily explodey process of detaching these side tanks. Yes, I could just press the spacebar and detach them and let them, you know, fall onto the ground. But that wouldn't be very fun. And hey, we want to make sure they definitely get clear of the train. So I decided to flip those engines back into their horizontal position. And uh, there they go, off on their adventure to explore their new habitat. We have introduced life to the Juno Arctic, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and that's going to... Well, actually, they exploded now. So there's a, there is the land train. It's sliding a bit, isn't it? <laughs> so, so the brakes aren't doing a particularly good job in keeping this thing still. Let's just fire up our engines and get moving. Although that being said, <laughs> the uh, one of the SAS wheels from the dearly departed fuel tanks is uh, rolling towards us. So let's just uh, try and uh, shunt it out of the way and then very carefully manoeuvre around it. I know SAS wheels can be a little bit finicky when it comes to Kraken attacks, uh, but in this case, it seemed to, you know, not pose too much of a threat. And there we go! We are now in motion! The land train is moving! I know, I feel like at some point I should mention that someone's going to make the snarky comment, Oh, aren't all trains land trains? Ha <laughs> ha! Yes, very good, very good. But you know, guys know what I mean, it's not like a rail train, right? Rail tra You know what? That's weird, isn't it? Right? Because if, if planes fly and ships sail and cars drive, what do trains do? I guess they drive because they've got a driver, but you know, they, they, they rail. They glide. Don't know. This is, this is getting too deep for a Kerbal Space Miracle commentary right now. So as you can see, I'm just trying to uh, maneuver the train to uh, flatter ground so I can safely plant a flag, try out the drills, etc. Uh, the thing was sliding about a bit. It took some experimentation. The reason why some of the carriages are sliding a bit is because the friction control on the wheels is basically trying to assume control. So you kind of have to right click a lot of the wheels on the rear carriages and disable friction control by pressing friction control, setting it to manual and then reducing the slider down to the minimum value, which is uh, zero. And that seems to stop the sliding a little bit. But some experimentation is required. I did try it out on Kerbin first, make sure the train worked and it required a different kind of 
friction control setting. Like, I think only the middle carriage needed the friction control disabling. So, your mileage may vary. Is that a pun? Because it's a car? Whatever. Uh, so, just experiment with the friction control values of the rear carriages. And that'll, you know, keep things under control if you're finding that the train is sliding about. And, of course, you can try out this craft for yourself using the link in the description to download the craft file. And there is our flag plant, by the way. One thing to note as well is I did actually inspect all of the wheels of the land train upon landing. Just to make sure they were all intact. And if one of them had broken, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Because you may have noticed during the build time lapse, we have... Uh, some cargo containers at the back of the science labs that contain lots and lots and lots and lots of repair kits. So we can repair any of the wheels lots of times and we can repair stuff like the big solar panels I guess as well uh, just in case anything gets damaged. Of course it's not like perfect if every single wheel on the train breaks. I don't think we've got enough. I'm not sure how many of we got, we got a lot, basically. I don't know if it's enough for, like, every single wheel of the train more than once, but I think it's good enough. I think, <laughs> all things considered, it's unlikely we're ever going to need all of the repair kits. So we've got that at our disposal as well. If it wasn't already obvious on the screen, I'm just showing some sped-up footage of me going on a nice uh, surface expedition across the Arctic to show you that this thing can, you know, comfortably drive long distances without flipping over or anything. It's got a very wide stand, so it doesn't flip over at all really and of course the wheels themselves don't break and the joints between the carriages do indeed mean that we can handle changes in terrain without seesawing up or down depending on if we're going up or down that was probably not the best way of conveying that thought but it doesn't matter guys because the video is pretty much over i really hope you enjoyed it i really hope you enjoyed this craft and i must once again give a massive thanks to cyber ghost vpn for sponsoring this episode it really is a great deal and i have actually genuinely been using cyber ghost daily since i signed up for them so i highly recommend it from a personal experience uh, remember to click that link in the description and in the pinned comment if you want to make use of my 82 percent discount that's only one pound 99 a month which is like very, very cheap. So go check that out. Uh, there are links on screen if that wasn't obvious by this point. And I'm just going to end the video. I'm just going to end the video.